COVID. And we may have some folks watching us right now uh, that maybe decided to stay in on this cold winter night tonight. But we're glad you all are here. And uh, I'm excited. Uh, everyone's welcome. And uh, real, I, I'm, I'm going to try to move somewhat quickly tonight, uh, being that it's a school night. But you Jackson County folks don't have to worry because y'all are on a two-hour delay already. So, um, Swain is too. I haven't got – well, my phone will be, you know, going off here in a little bit. But uh, probably so. Um, and see, we've got ah, more folks just coming in. I love it. All right. So, hey, our idea for 2020 is this idea right here. We want to fix our eyes on Jesus, knowing that he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And, that, and also, when we fix our eyes on him, our challenge as individuals and as a church is that we'll move because Jesus ain't sitting still, all right? And he, and like, yes, he wants to have fellowship with us, and we talked a couple of weeks ago how he invites us to the table with him to have fellowship, but Jesus is on a mission. We're on a mission. We want to reach the world around us, and, uh, and we want to make that, that eternal mark in the lives of those around us. In fact, on Sunday, we started a new series called Now and Forever, and we're looking at several different ideas uh, in this, over these next few weeks on Sunday, uh, it, I mentioned on Sunday, it's kind of a, kind of a series that will help you defend your faith as we look at creation and we look at just how obvious it is when we, when we look all around us and we're going to talk a little bit about just our own bodies tonight and how that that's a remarkable creation of God as well. Um, but, uh, our first message in our series on Sunday was called eternity. And we looked at this idea of what it meant and how we're all going to step there one day. And the Bible has a lot to say about eternity, and, 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 and we think about it. We're wired to think about it. It's in our nature. Uh, we, 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 we even went through a couple of exercises on Sunday. If you were here, you got to close your eyes and try to imagine eternity, which our minds can't comprehend. We can't fathom that. We can't, we can't think of that, that time frame, but it's in our hearts. We know it's in our hearts, and we saw for, and I even gave you some historical data about how civilizations every civilization that's ever existed on the face of this earth has had eternity in their hearts we talked about the the incans and the egyptians and the chinese civilizations and even the vikings and how they all had these practices where they prepared themselves for eternity um and then we wanted to encourage you that it doesn't begin when we die our eternity begins when we're born and we also talked about that the fact that god has put eternity in our hearts and all around us that is scriptural we we saw that in the Bible. And the last thing that we mentioned, and it's not something to try to scare anyone, and it's not something to try to uh, cause us to live our lives in fear. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's to cause us to live our lives with a sense of urgency and uh, just a sense of wanting to do what Jesus has called us to do, that we all have an appointment with eternity and we cannot reschedule it. All right? So it's there. Um, and... Um, Tonight, we're going to look at this idea, and, and, it's, and I, I just love how we can all come together. We're all so different. We, we, we're going to look at this idea tonight of how Jesus impacts us, not just now, but forever. And so we're building off of that idea of eternity on Sunday. I'm going to be, uh, for the most part, in the Gospel of John tonight. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn somewhere, you can turn to the Gospel of John. We're going to start and look at one verse in the, in, in the Gospel of John. Then we're going to look at a little story in the Gospel of John. We're going to be in Psalm 139 for a minute, and I've got some supporting scripture, and most of that scripture is going to come from the Gospel of John. So we're going to be looking in there uh, tonight, and, and, and this idea of eternity, I didn't really touch on. I, I mentioned something about how we don't want to scare you, but we all have fears. Everybody in life has fears. All right, and and we're all we're all so different, uh, and so your fears may not be the same kind of fears that I have. Um, I've been very open with you guys over the last year and talked about some of my anxiety that I struggle with every time my wife and my daughters get in the car. Uh, I get nervous, and it's not because I mean she's a wonderful driver, but I I, I dread. When they go somewhere with, without me, like as if I could control crazy other other crazy drivers out there, but I, I just I, I do I I, I kind of I, I fear that from time to time, and like when she's going from our house in Whittier to Walmart, I'm like, well, call me when you get there. Yeah, I mean, like, I it's just it's just kind of how it is. I mean, I just I, I get a little bit scared about that. 
Um, uh, I am definitely afraid of heights. I am like I am the guy. I am so afraid of heights. All right. To over listen, I will tell you to overcome that fear. To overcome that fear, often like if we ever get to go on vacations and we go to beaches and, and places like that, and they have the the bungee jumping. I've done that a few times. I've done that a few times to try to overcome that fear of of heights, and it's so much fun, but it's really scary. Um. And it's not really worked to overcome my fear of heights. And I found that out. I, I found that out seriously. There, there was a movie that came out. I can't remember if it was National Geographic or the History Channel. I highly recommend it if you get a chance to watch it. It's a movie called Free Solo. And um, you probably have never even heard of the movie. Uh, check it out. It's, it's about these. You want to talk about, like, crazy people. And I'm just, I'm sorry, but they just are. Free, uh, a free solo is, the, is mountain climbing or rock climbing without a harness. And these guys do it, uh, and, and they do it like on the face of rocks, and they don't have any harnesses on them. And this one guy, I don't remember the name of the, the face that he climbed. Like, no one had ever done it before, and it was like 3,500 feet just up this straight, straight up this, and like, I'm, oh, my God. And I'm watching that. Anyway, I was watching that movie, and as I'm watching it, I'm laying in bed watching it, my knees are shaking I, as I'm watching it. I get nervous. I'm so afraid of heights. All right, um, I have a slight fear of cats, even though we have one, because uh, she scares me when I come around the corner sometimes. I have a fear of cats. I, I, I'm afraid of spiders. I just, if I see one, I'm going to kill it. I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but I just, I, I can't help it. All right, but one of the fears I don't have and that some people legitimately do have is this fear of darkness or this fear of death, and it's kind of right there. That's a great fear that many of us have is this idea that one day we'll be under the earth and we're, our time here is going to come to an end. And, uh, and it brings about confusion when we think about it sometimes. Uh, it brings about some fear in our lives. But I, it's why I'm glad when, when, when I have this idea of death or moving on or passing on or however you look at it or however you phrase it, I'm glad that Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 12, all right? He says this right here. He spoke to the people once more, and he's speaking to all those around him. He says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And it's not just life now. He's talking about eternal life. We don't have to live our lives in darkness and in hopelessness and in fear and, and, and all of these other things. And one of the guys that would have heard this, and we just spoke of him just a few weeks ago in one of our sermons on Sunday, and it might have actually, I don't know if it was this exact same scripture we're going to use tonight, but one of the guys who would have heard Jesus say this was a follower by the name of Thomas. And Thomas had been following Jesus for about three years, and he thought Jesus, like many of the disciples, he thought Jesus had come to give them political freedom from Rome. That's a lot of the disciples and a lot of the followers believe that's what Jesus came. He was going to be their earthly king. But Jesus was going to give them spiritual freedom and, and an assurance of so much more than just what this earth could offer. He had more in store for these guys, than his disciples, than they ever could have imagined, just like he does in our own lives. He's got so much in store for us if we'll follow him and if we trust him. And so our first point, and we see this in that scripture we just read, is that Jesus gives us light to live in now and for all of eternity. He is the light now in our lives, and he will be the light for all of eternity. And he always has more in store for us than, than what we really want for ourselves, and it's why he's worthy to submit our lives to. And, and all of these guys, the disciples, they, they spent time with Jesus, and, and they were there. And a few weeks ago, I talked about on a Sunday, I talked about the Last Supper. And they saw Jesus arrested. They saw him beaten. They saw him put on the, this, this farce of a trial for his life. They saw him tortured to death, and they saw him die. But we know the story. We're on the other side of it, all right? Three days later, Jesus came back to life, and the disciples went from devastation to joy. Their lives changed when they saw Jesus. 
except for one guy named Thomas. And we don't know what's going on, okay? Like, we don't know what, where Thomas was. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us where Thomas was when Jesus first appeared in the upper room. But I, when I read this story, it's just, it's amazing to me to think about how Jesus just shows up on the scene in John chapter 20. But the Bible says this, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, who was nicknamed the twin, also we know him as Thomas the Doubter, <laughs> was not with the others when Jesus came. And this is when Jesus came back to life after the resurrection. But they told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. All right, well, we don't know where Thomas was. The Bible doesn't say where he was at or what was going on, but he missed out on a big moment, right? I mean, it's like, hey, you missed church that Sunday, man. You missed a good one, all right? So Thomas was not there, all right? And so the Bible says we've seen, and, and the, the Bible says that the other believers said that we had, we've seen him, but Thomas says, hey, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. He knew all about the torture that Jesus had gone through on the cross, and he, he knew about the, the, the nails, and that's, that's a pretty hardcore statement. Thomas says, I'm going to need more proof. I'm going to have to experience it for myself. And there's a lot of people that come to church, and there's a lot of people that got to go through this Christian walk sometimes, and they say, you know, Jesus has impacted my life, and maybe he's changed my life, but I'm not quite ready to buy into who Jesus says he is. And I'm here to tell you that, listen, he is everything and more. And listen, I, I get it. Sometimes we get in a season of doubt. We get in a season of darkness. Thomas went through this as well. And we're going to look at some of the things that Thomas dealt with during this kind of season of difficulty and, and darkness and some things that you may be dealing with as well, but to try to encourage you that Jesus is the light in your life now, and he'll be the light forever. And some of us have doubts like Thomas, and, and I want to just encourage you tonight that we can know by what, the, what God's word says is Jesus can overcome our doubts. And we all, and this kind of, and again, I'm, I'm trying to build off some of the stuff we talked about on Sunday. We all have intellectual doubts from time to time. When it, like this faith thing, man, y'all do that? Do you wrestle with that sometimes, your faith and the intellectual doubts? And some people are like, well, I've got to see it to believe it. And Jesus was, you know, a couple thousand years ago. And so people are naturally skeptical. And some people have to see evidence of God to believe it. And and, and, and I know, hey, here in the South, and, and I had some of this experience growing up too, that for a lot of people, Christianity is more about religion than a relationship, and it's just more about do and doing these things and doing these things all the time. And, and, and some people look at the Bible as more of just a historical relic and not an accurate portrayal of who God is and how Jesus is revealed through it. And a lot of people go, well, listen, if God is so great, then why is there so much? Here's, here's a big intellectual doubt that a lot of people struggle with. If God is so great, then why is there so much evil in the world? Why does injustice and pain dominate our society? And I'm going to give you the short answer because we don't have a whole lot of time tonight, and this is it right here, okay? We live in a fallen, broken world. Sin has done this. This is not God. It's not his ways, it's our ways, and it's the penalty of sin. And so because of that, it's a, it's a broken and fallen world. And so we see in this story that Thomas is like, hey, I'm not going to believe it until I see him. I've got doubts. And a lot of you maybe have doubts as well, or maybe you struggle with some doubts. And so John, in the Gospel of John, continues with this story, picking up in verse 26. Eight days. So eight days, Thomas had to walk around doubting and calling all the other guys like, I don't believe y'all, I don't believe you. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. He didn't miss the service this time. The doors were locked. Like, could y'all just imagine? Like, I, I think this, to me, I, again, I tell y'all all the time, like when I read the Bible, sometimes I may read it a little bit differently than y'all or whatever, but like, I, I kind of see Jesus' sense of humor in this. I don't know. I just kind of, I, I kind of, I could kind of, I think it's kind of funny, right? I mean, the doors were locked, and suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. I mean, like, come on, he just sidles right up. He's like, peace, what's up? That's what, I mean, that's, all of a sudden, Jesus is standing right there, peace be with you, he said, and then he said to Thomas, I mean, like, this right away, he knew Thomas's doubts. 
He said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And I think sometimes, listen, he, he speaks directly to Thomas, and it's powerful. He's saying, hey, Thomas, if you've got doubts, come on. And for us today, what the invitation that Jesus gives us all is this. If you have doubts, come on. He ain't afraid. He wants to show you who he is. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants us to believe so that he can do wonders in our life. And a lot of people might look at this as a rebuke of Thomas. I don't think he's rebuking Thomas when I read this. I look at it as an invitation. I look at it as an invitation. Hey, Thomas, come on. Check, come here. Believe. Believe. And so I know that we have these doubts, and sometimes people go, well, look, well, why doesn't God just make himself so obvious? And, and, and I touched on this on Sunday. I, I think he has. We look all around us, and we see creation. Romans 1 spoke to that, and we see, we see so much order in this world that has the potential to just be chaotic. But I believe that this, this design and this order that we see all around us implies that there had to be a designer. The, the, the creation all around us implies that there has to be a creator. And we look at ourselves in the human body, and, I, and some of y'all may have learned this and maybe a class you took or something, or maybe it's just a neat fact that maybe you know or whatever. But, like, we can't look at ourselves and go, ah, oh, you know, we're just kind of an accident. We're just kind of here. It's just, it's just fake. It's just whatever. It's random. The human body has just evolved over time. The human body has enough blood vessels. Each human body has enough blood vessels to circle the world two times. That's crazy creation right there. That ain't random. Over 60,000 miles, our bodies are a miracle, and they speak to God's glory themselves. In fact, listen, we talked about creation in Romans 1, but I love what David says in Psalm 139. He says this. He says, I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul, we, I, I spoke to this on, uh, on Sunday. We know it. We know there is a creator. We know there is a God. Our soul knows it very well. Hey, it's all, it's all good. You are wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and it's okay that you believe that because the Scripture tells us that. God may not answer all of our questions on this side of eternity, but he has made himself abundantly clear. And there's a lot of other people out there that think, well, listen, how can you say that Jesus is the way when there are so many other religions. I've got doubts because there are so many other world religions and we struggle with that and some people struggle with that idea. What about all the other religions? They all teach the same things. I would just tell you in a very simple way and in, 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 in kind of a compact sermon like tonight that I can, no they don't. They all have very different ways to God. Christianity is the only one who says that the only way is through Jesus. And Jesus himself says it. So you can look at Jesus and you can go, man, he was a swell guy. He was a great guy, man, and he taught people to love one another. And he taught, like, listen, he either is who he says he is or he is a complete madman. That's, I mean, that's, when you look at Jesus, you go, oh, he's a great guy. Well, listen, he might be a great guy, but like, he either is who he says he is, he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, he is the only way to the Father. Or he's crazy. John 14, 6, this is what separates our faith from the other faiths. Jesus says, and, he spe and by the way, he's speaking to Thomas right here in this passage of Scripture. I am the way and the truth and the life. There's that word life again, now and eternal. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's just, that's, that's the words of Jesus. And so when we look at other religions around the world and we wonder what's going to happen, to, and listen, here's, I, I, this is what I would tell you. I, I, I trust God in his grace and his sovereignty and in his wisdom and everything. His ways are so much higher and more. Listen, I, I'm going to put my faith in Christ, and I'm going to believe what Jesus says. 
and understand that he can overcome my doubts. I believe he is who he says he is. And another kind of doubt that we have is brought on by things that happen to us. A lot of people have a hard time with Christian faith and believing that Jesus is the way because of this next thing right here because of our circumstances, but Jesus overcomes our circumstances, even the worst of them here on this earth. Everybody in this room, everyone in here, has been through good and bad circumstances in their life. Some of you have been hurt by things and your pain is internal and, 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 you, and, 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 and you don't, listen, and I know that we're healing and, and things are going on in our life, but, but on the inside, we have a lot of doubts. And some of y'all have gone through, have, have experienced loss in your life and it's caused you to doubt God or to doubt that Jesus is good. Some of you have had some things happen to you, very real, personal, hurtful things that have caused you to doubt God's goodness. Maybe you were sexually abused. Maybe you were raped. Maybe you had a miscarriage. Maybe you've had cancer. It's been a, it's been a force in your life. Maybe death or divorce. But in all of these circumstances have caused you to wonder how God could possibly be good. And I know there's several of you in here that if you told your story, it would break our hearts tonight. And, I, and, and, and there's no way that I could understand it, but I'm going to tell you who our God is, and I'm going to tell you what he does with our circumstances and what he's done through Scripture and what we see in Scripture. Our God is the only one who can take a bloodstained cross and turn it into an empty tomb. He's the only one who can take tragedy and turn it into triumph, who can take pain and turn it into progress. Jesus really can take the worst circumstance in your life and he can turn it around for his glory and for your good. And listen, he's bigger than your circumstance. He is bigger than the pain of this world. He's bigger than all these things that go on in this world. And he reminds us of that in John 16, that we are going to have pain. This is a fallen, broken world. Nobody escapes it, y'all. Nobody escapes it. And we all experience it to varying degrees. But Jesus goes on, he says all these things to his disciples, and he says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace, not in the world. When we look for our peace and our happiness and our joy in the things of this world, they will ultimately crumble, y'all. They just will. He says, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Some translations just say this simply. You'll have trouble. It's going to happen. But he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. He's overcome any circumstance this world can throw at you. And this little bit of time, and again, I mentioned it on Sunday. We put so much into this small amount of time that we have on this earth. And I get it, man. We're, we're human and we hurt and we feel pain and our circumstances cause us to doubt. But we are on just we're on the front end of eternity, y'all. And you know, we had our we had a great men's Bible study last night. Man, it was it was awesome. We had a great one. I like I almost got in trouble with my wife because we were up here so late and everything. And I got the girl, I got the girls home late and everything. And I called her like it started at six and um and, and I didn't like we didn't get like my whole idea was to be done by seven and it was like eight o'clock and we were trying to get out of here and I had to go get the girls from my mother in law's to take them home and Got them in bed late. Anything. Anyway, it was just an awesome. And the reason why is because we were talking about the things of this world that discourage us as men. And I was trying to encourage our men, and we were just opening up. There's about 10 or 12 of us here last night. We're trying to just open up and say, hey, listen, our encouragement comes from Christ. And we looked at some scripture last night that he offers us eternal encouragement. That was the scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Our God gives us eternal encouragement, everlasting encouragement, and grace. And it's always there for us. And one of the things we talked about when it stuck out when we were leaving last night, and man, it was just a powerful moment to have all these men in here, and we held hands and we prayed as we closed out, and, and Lou was here last night with us, and, and he said, hey, none like all this stuff, and this, is, this is scriptural. I'm going to paraphrase it, all right? All this suffering, all, this, all these tough times, they're nothing compared to the glory that we will experience. They're nothing. And we've got to have faith in that, and we've got to trust that, and we've got to believe that, because if we believe Jesus is who he says he is, 
He can overcome our circumstances. And then another struggle that we have, another struggle that we have about like whether we should follow Jesus and if he is who he says he is, is this, our worldly desires. But I want to I want to encourage you that Jesus can overcome our worldly desires. A lot of times that keeps us from fully following him and trusting in him that we can have like an abundant life in him now. Kind of these lifestyle objections, all right? A lot of people say, this is what, like, I, I, listen, I've dealt with this kind of stuff, and it's crazy, like, for 10 years now in, in, in ministry, and, and a lot of people kind of have this attitude, all right? If I believe Jesus, if I believe he is who he says he is, and I confess him as Lord, it's really going to change my life. I'm like, well, yeah. It's going to affect my lifestyle, and I don't want that to change because I've got some really strong desires, and I really enjoy some things of this world. And if I do that and I walk out today, and if I believe everything that you say, it's going to affect everything about how I live, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready to give up. You ready? Here we go. I don't know if I'm ready to give up my good time. What do you think it means to follow Jesus? Like, you get the wrong idea, man. I mean, like, it's the best. Like, it is the best. Nothing is better than following him. He, nothing gives us more abundant life than following him. And I get it because, but, but I understand. I understand those temptations, and I understand that kind of, I mean, I, I, I get where you're coming from there because I grew up, uh, in church, and, and I grew up learning all of these things too. Then I went off to college and I started pursuing things of the world as well. Whether it's alcohol or substances, and or whether it's money, material things, or a dream home, or we kind of we start to pursue these other things instead of putting Jesus at the forefront. We fix our eyes on these things of the world, and they look so good, y'all. They look so good. And we start chasing them, and we have these hopes, and we have these dreams, and it's so it's kind of fun to think about like what what, but but you know what you know what happens to so many people, y'all. I've just seen this so many times over and over again. It just becomes a trap. It's a trap, and it and it slowly strangles people, and they get older, and they start to lose hope, and they turn bitter. And they get angry, and they get older, and they walk around like they've been sucking on lemons. Because this world is this world will beat you up, chew you up, and spit you out. Yep. People go, I don't know if I want to live my life that way. I want to live it for the world. And listen, I, I listen. God wants more for us than just good health, a nice car, a nice house, or just this partying lifestyle. He's got more in store for us than that. All of those things, I mean, if we think about that, if we, if we think about all of those things and carry them out, you, I, I mentioned it on Sunday, like our life is a mist. You can take as good a care of your, and I encourage, I encourage you to take care of your body. I encourage you to eat healthy and do all of those things, all right? But guess what? One day you're going to die. Your nice body is going to end up in a graveyard, all right? Have a great night. Uh, uh, <laughs> one day your dream car is going to turn into a piece of junk. Your dream home will either be torn down or turn into an abandoned building. Your party and lifestyle one day will leave you in a prison. Not maybe physically, but a prison of addiction or guilt or shame or confusion or doubt. A prison of bad choices. But when we follow Jesus, he never, ever, ever leads us astray. He won't do it. He don't know how to do it. Maybe my favorite verse in, this, in Scripture, because I just keep, I keep reminding myself of this, is all those other things are of Satan, the thief. He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Not like this, you know, boring, oh, I can't have no fun kind of life. Ever since I surrendered my life to Jesus and I began following him, the relationships in my life, not just I'm like my, I'm, my marriage, yeah, it's awesome. My kids, I love them. I love that we're teaching them to follow Jesus and they can just see us just as, as 
a mom and dad who love Jesus and love them, but I'm talking about the relationships that I've built have so much more meaning now. My life has so much more meaning now. The fact that the blessings that God gives me and the fact that I'm understanding that I'm just a steward of everything he ever, that he pours out of my life. I'm just a steward to honor him with everything that he's given me. I mean, listen, he, he's overcome. And, I, and we're all humans, so to some degree we're going to have these worldly desires. But Jesus will overcome those worldly desires and give you so much more. And then the last point tonight is this, is that he has overcome life and he's overcome death. That's just who he is, and that's what he did, and that's what he does. And people have these doubts, and they go, well, look, man, I've tried this Jesus thing, and it didn't work out. In most cases, not all. I'm going to give grace. In most cases, it's the equivalent of somebody that goes to the gym for two days, and then they quit because they don't see results. That's, that's what, but most people who say, I've tried that Jesus thing, you went to two church services, and you were like, ah, I'm giving up. I mean, that's, that is, I've seen it. And, and, and a lot of people have doubts because they've, they've kind of gotten the wrong idea about what it means to follow Jesus. They think it's, about, it's all about what, what you do instead of what Jesus did for you. And so maybe your experience has been a very legalistic form of Christianity. And, and, and when that's the case, I'm just going to tell you, when that's the case and you get wrapped up in that and it becomes all about what you do, it, it holds you back. It doesn't set you free. Some people have been hurt by a church. Some people have been hurt by other Christians. Sometimes here in this part of the country that we live in, the idea of Christianity is more of just a, a, a symbol or it's symbolic. It's something that we do on Sunday, but it doesn't really change our lives. Jesus wants to change your life. That's who he is, and that's what he does. And again, people go, well, what's the difference? You know, you got Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha. It's all like, it's all the same, right? Like, it's all the same. It's real simple. Jesus is still alive. That's, that. I'm just going to be as simple. Jesus is still alive. The world cannot, has not ever been able to explain the resurrection. I, like, y'all are like, I like to watch TV shows sometimes. So they ain't a whole lot worth watching on TV, but I love to I love to see oh coming up on the history channel this Sunday the resurrection and investigation like they don't know how to explain it they don't get it man it's been a couple of thousand years and people still can't explain it it's because he is god it's because he's still alive the world is still fascinated it, but he's Jesus is still changing lives and religious dead men can't do that Jesus can because he's still alive. And listen, he loves you. He loves you as you are. And he wants to just change your life and lead you into that. And this is Thomas's, like, like Thomas finally saw it, man. He, he finally saw it. He saw Jesus. Jesus like, come on, Thomas. You got some doubts. Let me show you. Let me show you it's me. And he went up and he touched the wounds. And then verses 28 and 29, he says, this was what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And Jesus said, you believe because you've seen me. And then Jesus is just, he's throwing something out there about me and you. So we don't know, but that's what, that's what the scriptures, this what scripture is right here at the end. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's us a couple of thousand years later. We believe he is who he says he is. It's not about what we do. It's all about what Jesus has done and the life that he could give us now, the life that he offers us for eternity, the finished work on the cross, about him coming to earth, him dying on the cross, him paying for our sins, him conquering death. There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. And he sets us free, and he gives us life now, and he gives us the assurance of an eternity with him, eternal life with him. And I know, listen, I mean, when I think of the life of Jesus and, 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 and what the disciples had to, had to look at and what, they, and what they saw and their doubts and their own doubts and their own circumstances and the things that are going on and seeing him nailed to the cross, they didn't realize that that cross was a symbol of victory. That cross was Jesus' way of saying, I'm going to overcome it all. I'm going to overcome it all. Just wait and see. And he did it. 
And he did it then, and he's still doing it now, and he'll be doing it forever. Amen? Let's pray together.